All right. Afternoon, everybody. How was lunch? Good? Good? Awesome. So this is the junior developer track. And so I'm kind of curious going into this what people's backgrounds are. So how many of you came to Rails from some kind of boot camp? OK. Uh, how long was that boot camp? Eight weeks, six weeks, 12 weeks, six months? Seven months? That's a long time. That's a degree. How many people have a, just a traditional CS, uh, CS degree? OK, cool. And then how many of you are just kind of learning by doing things, watching internet videos, stuff like that? Yeah. Well, that's uh, just so you know, that never changes. I've been developing for a long time, and internet videos and just trying things is pretty much the way you, you, you have to roll. So behind almost every Rails app and almost every app in general is a powerful language called SQL. And uh, I got this, the idea for this talk when I was working with a junior developer who was trying to build a, uh, a dashboard page and try to give some stats on user activity. He was using the tools that are built in to Ruby because that's, that's what he knew how to use. And the problem with that is that when you put that code in production, all of a sudden, instead of downloading the couple of hundred or a couple dozen rows that you have in your development system, and doing some calculations on that, now you're asking Ruby to pull down millions of rows and do calculations on that. This is a situation where clearly the database is the right place to be doing the heavy lifting. And so when we started pairing on this, he explained the problem, and I just immediately jumped into a, a, a SQL prompt and started writing a, a SQL query that gave the answers that we were looking for on the dashboard. And the thing that he said to me, and this is a key word for me, wait, how did you do that? And I have found over and over again, as I've worked with other developers, that any time I say the words, wait, how did you do that, I'm about to learn something. And so that was a, a, a learning moment for, for both of us. I learned that you know, not everyone has the SQL background. And he learned a lot about the tools that are available behind the scenes. So we spent the whole hour writing SQL queries, and um, you know, I think we, we both came away from that learning a few things. So uh, SQL, to put it another way, is the hero that Rails deserves. <laughs> uh, something we should probably get out of the way right up front. Is it SQL? Is it SQL? I go back and forth between both of them. It, it doesn't really matter. It's not like we're talking about GIFs here. Um, <laughs> SQL is officially the correct way. But if you are saying SQL and you know, Captain actually says, well, actually, it's, it's SQL, that's totally fine, because you can pull out the fact that it used to be SQL. And they changed it when they made the standard just because of some trademark uh, disputes or something with a, an airline or something like that. So it's officially SQL, but I say, I say it both ways. All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit about the, the backstory of SQL. We're going to look at some uh, wonderful examples and then talk about where you can go from here. A little bit about me. My name is Ryan DeLugas. Uh, I did not sneeze through my name there. It's actually pronounced that way, DeLugas. Anyone else here Polish? All right, We're, we will find some barbecue pierogi after this in this town. Uh, I've been programming for about 20 years, uh, 15 of those professionally. Uh, I live in Cincinnati, Ohio with uh, my family there. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Lebowski, so I don't need to tell you my favorite movie. Uh, I'm a consultant, which pretty much means I can say yes to things before I actually know how to do them. Learning as you go is a uh, skill that you'll learn as a developer. And uh, recently, I have uh, started uh, working as a, an instructor for Girl Develop It, which is an organization that helps adult women uh, get launched into technology careers. So if that's something that's uh, interesting to you, um, talk to me afterwards. I'd be happy to talk about it. 
All right, so the world before ORMs. ORMs, that's the, the all-encompassing term for things like Active Record. So in the late 90s, we were building web applications, but we weren't using these, these tools like Active Record. We were just putting the, the, the SQL directly in line with our code. We were using Perl, we were using Cold Fusion, um, we were using um, PHP. PHP still is in use today. Uh, the structure of PHP apps is a lot better today than it used to be, though. And uh, we, we would just put these, these SQL strings right there in line in the code, and it got messy, and it was complicated, and it was frustrating. So let me give you an example of that. Say we had an application, and we wanted to display a list of all the people that are in our system. So we would have some... SQL that we would uh, write like this, a very basic query, select the name and some other parameters from our people table. Okay, that's, that's great, so we've got the query, and now we have to execute that query against our database. And when we do that, we're gonna get back a bunch of data collected into an array of arrays. So you have a big array, and each element of that array is one row from your database. Okay, well, we've got the data, but now to use it in our application in our kind of object-oriented way, we need to collect, we need to build those uh, people, and then we need to collect them into a, a, an array in our language. So we'll iterate through each row of the results there. We'll create a new person, and then for every single element of data that came back from our query, we need to just manually assign it into the different attributes that our object has. And then we have to consider, like you see on the last line here, things like, well, in the database it's stored as a zero or a one, but our object knows about Booleans, and so we need to translate that. You have to think about all those kinds of little gotchas there. And then finally, we'll shove that person onto our array of people, rinse and repeat. But now you have to do the same sort of thing for every single interaction with the database that your application has. It gets very monotonous, it gets very error prone, and the code is very fragile. I mean, if you look at, at that code there, it, you can imagine if you change something with the structure of that query, it's very easy to break that mapping. So as a developer, I think we all, at least I do, but I think we all have this proclivity to avoid repetitive tasks. And if we see something that we have to type or do more than once, we try to find a way to automate it with software. And so now is the time where I admit to something that is hilariously dangerous and naive. The first application I was ever paid to build, um, again, this is uh, late 90s, it was a PHP app, and it was, you know, your standard, uh, cms -y type of application, small business app, written in PHP, and a lot of the forms looked like this. We have an HTML form, we collect a few uh, fields, and we submit it. But take a look at that top line there where it's submitting to. It's submitting to something called savedata.php. It doesn't seem very specific, and it doesn't have to be, because my way of getting around the problem was I passed in a hidden field called table name. And then on the back end, I went ahead and um, just took that table name and then dynamically built a SQL query to insert data into the database, update data, delete data, whatever needed to be done. This is very, very unsafe. If you don't understand why this is unsafe, May I suggest that you attend some of the application security co uh, courses that are uh, later on this week. I think you will find them very interesting. My solution to the problem was, you know, please don't hack me um, on the submit. Now, this was behind an admin interface and stuff, so I guess you could kind of justify it like that, but really, this, this, is no way, this is no way to code. So fast forward a little bit to the mid-2000s and ORMs are starting to become popular. So in the Java space, we had Hibernate and um, OJB. And in Rails, we have Active Record. So with Active Record, you, you know, you take this giant mess of code that's, that's here, and you replace it with a one-liner. 
That's great. So if Active Record can replace all that, why should I bother to learn SQL? Well, one reason is because SQL is everywhere. SQLite, which is the uh, database that ships with Rails for development, is the most, uh, if not top five, uh, most popular, widely installed piece of software in the world. SQLite is installed on every Android phone, every iPhone, every Mac, every Windows 10 PC, every flavor of Linux, Chrome, Safari, Firefox, it's in a bunch of cars, it's in airplanes, it's literally everywhere, right? But so what? You can still talk to it with Active Record and ORM tools, why do you need to learn SQL? It's because ORMs come and go. Uh, I've probably used three or four different ones. They all have a different API. It changes every time. And once you finally learn how to do something beyond the basics, you're looking it up in the documentation, and you don't get to retain any of that. So three to four years from now, maybe you're using a different language and a different ORM. Well, you're not gonna be able to use all those things you learned about with Active Record. There's gonna be different uh, structures. There's gonna be different gotchas. There's gonna be different things that, oh, if you do this in Hibernate, everything goes very badly. If you do it in Active Record, it's fine. But the thing about SQL is that it's pretty much always the same. So apps, they come and go. Frameworks, databases too. SQL will live on. If you think this poem is incredibly cheesy, you can thank Chris Nelson, uh, my friend back in the Cincinnati user group. Uh, he is at Super Chris. Please tweet at him and tell him how uh, how great his, his poetry is. You do have to pronounce SQL the, uh, the unofficial way to make the, the syllable count work out for the haiku there, but you know. So the real point of all of this is that you want to learn the native language wherever you are. Richard Hipp, he's the creator of SQLite. He was on a podcast recently and he started talking about being a tourist. And the, the thing that he said that really struck me was, as a tourist, I can get around by pointing at things. And I can pick up a few keywords, and I can communicate roughly with the people that are there. But unless I know the language, I can't start a business. I can't really succeed on a personal level with people and have, have good relationships. I have to learn that native language. And so by learning SQL, which is the native language of any database, that's gonna help you transition from being a junior tourist programmer to someone who is a seasoned pro who knows when it's the right tool for the job. So that's the main point today. We'll look at a couple examples. In order to do this, we need to create a few things, uh, a, a basic schema. We will create authors and books. We'll do this stuff in Active Record because Active Record is great for this kind of thing. Um, so we have an author which has many books. We have a book which belongs to an author. And then here's the migration, so you can kind of see the fields we've got. Obviously an incomplete list from what you'd have in a, in a real application, but for authors we have a name, a country, an email, and a birth date. And then for books we've got titles, pages, a publication date, topics, um, an ISBN number, and most importantly an author ID, so this is how Inside the relation of the database, uh, the authors or the books are tied back to their corresponding authors. So say you're on a new project, or maybe it's an existing project, and your, your boss or your client wants some more information about the data that you have. Maybe they want to know how many books you have. OK? Obviously very simple. There's the SQL for that. And likewise, there's the um, very simple active record call that you would use to get the same thing. How many authors do we have? Same thing. Simple select the count of, of IDs from the authors table. And in active record, you would just do author.count. 
okay? So let's look at how we would type this into our database. So if you were at your terminal, you would type, this depends on your database, but if you're using Postgres, which I, I would suggest you do, Postgres is a great database, uh, but almost all of them have a, a command line tool like this, we would launch it against our database. And then we're dumped into yet another prompt where we can type things that are commands directly issued to the database. And so we will type in our query and we'll get our results. And so we've got 4,000 books. Likewise, we'll do the same thing on our authors. We'll type in our SQL query and we'll find out that we've got 500 of those. Okay. That's all very basic, but we need to get more in depth here. We could have done all of that with just active record. So how many books do we have in each topic? Okay, that's getting more interesting. We need to use a, a tool that we haven't used yet called group by. So we'll select our topic and the count of those topics from our books. And then we'll group it all together by topic. And so what this is going to give us is a set of results that just includes one line for each of the topics that are in our database and a count of all the books that go along with that topic. Does that make sense to everyone? You could also do that in Active Record, of course. It's still simple. But these, remember, are very simple cases. As you get more complicated with these, uh, these queries, and like the one we're gonna do in just a minute, by the time you figure out how to write the active record code to make this stuff happen, you might as well have just done it directly in the database. So let's look at something a little more complicated. So let's ask, how many books do we have in each topic and let's find the minimum, maximum, and mean page count by topic. Okay. Hmm. I don't know how we would do that in Active Record. You might have to inline some SQL to be able to do that. So we'll start off with our SQL query. Select topic, the count of the topic, and we'll give it a, a, a familiar name for us using that as keyword. And then we'll select the minimum pages. This is using minimum, which is a function that our database provides to us. The database provides lots and lots of these kinds of handy functions that you can use to do things like minimums, maximums, uh, averages, standard deviations, um, all sorts of uh, statistical functions and other calculations, summations. So then we'll get our max pages. And then we'll get our average pages, and we'll round it off uh, to two decimal places so, uh, you know, uh, so it, it looks reasonable. Again, we'll get it from our books, and we'll group it by topic again. And when we look at our results, you'll see that we've got our topics, our topic count, that's the number of books for each topic, and then we've got the calculations that we did on the pages that are in our books. Now, are you gonna be calculating the number of pages in books? Probably not, but you probably have users hitting your systems, and you're probably tracking events that those users are creating, or you're tracking um, you know, the number of likes a user gives to some thing, and someone might come to you one day and say, well, hey, can you give me some basic statistics on this stuff? And that stuff might be scattered into a bunch of different tables that you need to, uh, to uh, join together and use these functions and let the database do the, do the work for you rather than trying to pull all of that data into your Rails app and do the work in Ruby. Because again, you might be dealing with millions and millions of rows here and it's not feasible to pull all that data down locally. So let's talk a little bit about how we would join data together. So how can we answer the question, which authors have written five or more books on a given topic? That's an interesting business question. Because you might want to contact those authors and say, oh, hey, you're, you're really 
on the ball cranking out these Ruby books. You know, do you want to come talk at our Ruby conference or something like that? That's an interesting business question and that's where you're gonna have to combine your different data together and this is the sort of thing that's a lot easier to explore and do directly within SQL than it is to do within Rails. So to quickly explain joins for those who are unfamiliar, if you have authors over here and books over here, a join combines those two tables together based on some criteria. And in our example, the criteria is that the author has an ID, the book has an author ID in it, and if those fields are equal, then that's how we know that those records should be linked together. That's the essence of a join. Okay, so how do we realize this in SQL? So we have the author's name, a topic, a count of the books, because remember we need to figure out how many books has this author cranked out. We're gonna select from the author's table, and then we need to join it to the books table, and that's how we specify our join criteria there. So we're gonna say we're gonna select this stuff from the author's table, join together with the books table based on this criteria. And then we'll group these things by the author's name and then the topic. So the same group by concept we had before, but now we're just extending it a little bit and um, using two different criteria, two different fields in that join. And then we'll say, well, we want to find just the authors who have written more than four books, five or more, or four or more, uh, or five or more is what we're looking for, so we're gonna use greater than four. Having is the same as a where clause, which I'm sure you're familiar with in a, in a very basic query. Select the user where ID equals blah, right? So a having clause is the exact same thing as a where, only it applies to the things that are grouped together. So since the authors are, are what's being aggregated here, we're going to be uh, calculating that, we're gonna be using that, uh, the having clause to, to limit our result set of the total number of books for each of those authors. And there we get the data. So of the you know, 500 authors that we have in our, in our test data here, we only have a handful of them who have written more than four books. And there's the topics that they've written things on. Unfortunately, Ruby didn't show up, nor did Rails, but that is the nature of randomness. Uh, the test data did not have that many authors writing Ruby and Rails books, um, at least uh, multiple books back to back. So that's pretty cool. And obviously you can take that query and you can build it from there. You can take these queries and you can nest them together. So you can take the results of one and then apply it to the uh, search criteria that another, uh, another query is using. We could have joined in another table here. Say it's a table uh, of sales data. So instead of just asking how many authors have written five or more books on a given topic, how many authors have written five or more books on a given topic and have sold more than 1,000 copies of each of those books? Those are the kind of questions that you can answer, and by understanding how to write SQL, you can very easily come up with those kinds of, uh, those kinds of things on the fly. So um, joining data is it's obviously a, uh, a thing that you're gonna do a lot of. We just covered a, a very basic join there, the kind where you have uh, just the records that match up. You'll see that there's a lot of other types of joins. We're not gonna get into all the details of those, but um, suffice it to say, there are ways to say, well, give me everything that just matches, and then there's other ways to say things like, okay, well, give me everything that matches plus everything over here that doesn't match. 
So maybe some of the authors don't have books with specific topics that you're looking for. You could also include those authors if you wanted to. Things like that. And that's all a matter of the syntax and the different rules that you apply inside your query. OK, so let's talk a little bit about a tool called Explain. Aside from doing like ad hoc searches in your database and exploring data, the other reason you might want to have some knowledge of how the database is working behind the scenes is so that you can figure out why your app is so slow. I'm sure we've all run into the situation where you work on something, it works great on your laptop, and then you deploy it to production, and it's not so great. It's very slow. On your laptop, it's fine because, for one, you probably have an SSD, so that's super fast compared to the spinning disk that might be in your database server. And on top of that, on your, on your laptop, you might have 100 rows, and on the production database, you might have 100,000. That's a totally different ballgame when it comes to uh, searching through things in the database. So Explain is a tool that will let you understand how is the database trying to find this information. What's its plan? And it's really easy to run explain on literally any query. All you have to do is take the query that you want to test and stick the word explain in front of it. Optionally, on some databases, you can write explain analyze, and that will go the extra step of actually executing the query and giving you a little bit more information on, well, Explain told me what I think I'm going to do as the database. This is my plan for how I'm going to find this data. And this is how I think it's going to go. Explain Analyze says, here's my plan. And then I actually executed my plan. And this is what really happened. So I tend to, to use the, the Analyze just because it gives you some more uh, interesting information. And what you get from Explain is output that looks like this, which is extremely dense. And I do not expect you to walk out of here understanding how to read, except for one key word, or two key words, I guess. Sequential scan. Anywhere you see sequential scan in an explain from your database, that's probably a bad thing. And you want to avoid, at all costs, a sequential scan. Uh, a, se a sequential scan basically means the database has to look through every single row in the database, one by one, and see if it finds what you've told it to look for. That's very slow. That's as if you were trying to find uh, all of the words rails in a given textbook. And if you were trying to do that in real life, how would you do it? You would use the index in the back of the book. And if you had the index, you could say, oh, look, well, rails is mentioned on you know, pages x, y, and z. The database needs the same kind of thing. You can add an index very easily to your database, and that will help to resolve these issues where you have a sequential scan. Now, there is definitely an art to creating indexes that matter and indexes that improve performance. Um, we can't get into the details of those today. But suffice it to say, the first step in all of this is running explain on queries that are slow, or any queries, for that matter, in your database, and just looking for those keywords, things like sequential scan. Ooh, that, that's, that's a hot spot there. I probably want to look to, into adding an index on that, even if it's not slow on my development laptop. Rails will dump the output. Um, it will dump the actual SQL that's being run into the development logs when you're using your application in development mode. So you can just go into your log file, and any time you see the word select, you can go ahead and copy that, stick it into your database console, tack the word explain onto the front of it, and check out the output. It's a great way to learn more about how the database works, honestly, because you can kind of get into the database's head of like, how are you going to find this information? So in short, run explain on everything. So you might have noticed that I didn't include any mention of how do I directly call SQL from my Rails application? Um, that's because it's dangerous. You can definitely do that, and you will do that. 
But to get up here and say, well, this is how you do it and how you do it safely in a you know, 30 seconds that we're on a slide would be um, a little bit um, reckless, I think, and irresponsible because there's a lot of there, there's a lot of ifs and edge cases there that you could end up um, causing problems with, and I wouldn't want to lead you in that direction. But if you're doing reporting type of queries where you're not using data that's provided by the user, that's probably fine. You can use that in your app. If you do need to in incorporate some user data, like say you want to do a geographic search, so you want to find all of the coffee shops that are nearby a certain location, and you've decided to implement this query using raw SQL. That's fine, but make sure that you are sanitizing those inputs before you stick it into your query. You don't want to end up like the school where little Bobby Tables went. Mom gets a phone call, says, hey, it's your son's school. We're having some computer problems. Uh, did you name your son Robert, quote, semicolon, dash, dash, drop tables? Um, yeah, we call them little Bobby tables. So that's why you have to sanitize your user inputs. You never know when little Bobby tables is going to enroll at your school and start using your application. So where do you go from here? There's obviously a lot to this SQL stuff. If you don't have a book on your desk at work or at home uh, that is about databases and SQL, you should absolutely pick one up. So those are, that's not a list of recommendations or anything. That is just there are SQL books out there, and they are ranked by reviews. Pick one. You will be able to keep it for a very long time because SQL doesn't change that much. There is also going to be good documentation for your specific database where you can learn about things like the aggregation functions, um, uh, like geographic extensions and things like that that might be specific to your particular database. And uh, usually the docs are pretty good for those. Postgres has great documentation. Remote pairing, not necessarily remote pairing, but pairing in general is I think the best way for a junior developer to level up quickly. Working side by side, even with other junior developers working together trying to solve a problem, but especially if you're working side by side with someone more senior, that is a fantastic way to learn very quickly things that you might not necessarily pick up in a book because most likely you're gonna be working on a real production system with real production problems and they aren't going to be demonstrations of two tables with you know, five uh, attributes in each one. It's going to be real data, real problems in real systems. And that's when you learn. So absolutely pair program as much as you can. And if you don't have an opportunity to do that, there are um, a lot of places where you can uh, do that online um, and, and remotely pair with people on things like Screen Hero and stuff like that. Um, and just because I wanted to squeeze in one more GIF, uh, here is uh, a reminder that you should scour your logs for database queries, understand what they do, run explain on them, and um, figure out how uh, your application is really working behind the scenes. So the takeaways. The main one is learn the native language. Whether you're talking about travel or programming, it's, it's very helpful to know and speak the native language of the database, understand what Active Record is doing for you behind the scenes, and by all means, pick the right tool for the job. I use Active Record all the time. It is a great tool, but I know when to jump in and just use the database directly. And just because you have an ORM does not mean that it's wrong or bad to use SQL directly. You have a lot of tools, and you just need to know what they're good at and what they're not good at, and when to pick uh, the one for, uh, for the job that you have at hand. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. We have a couple minutes. Thank you.
my, my recommendation is don't do it without knowing what you're doing. Um, you mean executing raw SQL from within your Rails app? Yeah, like you're making active references. There's a few different ways to do it. Uh, basically, the one way you can do it is you can get a connection the, from, the, from the active record connection base. You can get a connection, you can execute raw SQL. That's very helpful if you're using it inside of a migration. Say you need to create a geography type of column in a Postgres database. If, if Rails doesn't know how to create a geography column, it can't use the normal schema migration stuff, and so you might need to execute SQL directly. So that's the time when you'd want to use uh, connection execute. Um, the other time you might want to do it, uh, or the other way you might want to do it is using find by SQL, which is a method on your model. This is the one where you need to be very careful. You need to be careful anyway, but you need to be careful that you aren't just, you know, throwing user data at uh, this thing. But the nice thing about using find by SQL is that it will automatically instantiate objects for you that are of the type that you called it on. So if you have authors and you said author.findbySQL and you provided it with a query, then you will get back author objects and they will have, for any parameters uh, that you didn't specify or that aren't really parameters on your model, um, naturally, things that you might have created in your query by hand there, like some of our count uh, columns and stuff, those will come back as virtual attributes attached to your model, and so you can just make the calls directly on them, just like any other attribute on your model. So, any other questions? I was wondering if you might Well, I don't have a specific example for that, for when table rewrites are necessary. Right, well, anytime you have a migration like that, you need to be careful that you're not gonna like take your app down. Um, a good example of a migration that you could add uh, directly with SQL would be if in, um, in Postgres, you can create indexes concurrently. But at least as of recently, you might be able to in five, but you couldn't just do that as a part of a normal migration. And so you need to kind of create your, um, your migration by hand, and you need to say, okay, I'm gonna create this index, and you would use all the same things that, that Rails is gonna do for you when it's creating the index, but you get to tack one keyword onto the query that says create index concurrently, and then the rest of the, uh, the, the, the parameters there. And so then when that executes, instead of the Rails generated SQL to create the index, it will use the string that you provided, and it will allow you to create uh, an index on a table that doesn't block access to the table like the normal non-concurrent create index does. So that's when one example of when you might use it in uh, a migration. All right, uh, this will be the last one. Uh, it's not necessarily faster. So the question is, is it faster to write the SQL um, directly? It's not necessarily faster. And you can observe this when you're looking at how your application operates. All of those things that you ask Active Record to do translate directly into uh, SQL queries that get executed against the database. And usually Active Record does the right thing. Um, there are some times when you might find a better way to um, skin the cat, um, for lack of a better word. Uh, and that's when you might want to step in and use some raw SQL, but typically Active Record does the right thing there. The key is to just look at what Active Record is doing and try to learn from it. All right, thanks a lot. <laughs>